good to be here this morning and uh, to celebrate All Saints Sunday. Uh, that's why everybody's feeling a bit sainty. I think, I think these guys over there are looking a little bit sainty too, right? <laughs> uh, so it is a joy to come and celebrate Christ our Lord, who indeed is the one who made us all saints by redeeming us through his blood. Uh, today I want to uh, share a couple of announcements with you as we welcome you. And remember, as you are welcomed here, I hope that you do feel welcomed. But remember, everyone is invited to the Lord's table. Now, this is the Lord's table. That's why we say everyone is invited to it. It's not our table. It's the Lord's table. So we invite you to the Lord's table. All those who are baptized in the name of the Lord are welcome to the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Some of the announcements we have is that Pastor Dean Piper will be leading uh, a series on the Gospel of Matthew, and that will be starting November 6th and 7th at Hope University. So if anybody would like to join, you are welcome. Uh, the new Wednesday evening prayer, I know many have been excited. The fact that we have an evening prayer coming up, and that will be on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Now remember, this continues during Advent. It will take different forms, but we invite you to join during that time. So you have the meal. And right after the meal, there's a chance to fellowship and to pray together. Uh, there has been many questions about the cantata. And, you know, Christmas is just around the corner. Hard to believe. We haven't been through Thanksgiving yet. Uh, but you can hear the Christmas songs already. The way it should be, right? Uh, so we invite you, uh, if you would like tickets, remember the tickets will be available at the uh, fellowship hall uh, uh, starting next weekend. And next weekend is the Joy of Giving weekend. So the tickets will be available there. But if you miss it, no worries. After November 11th, uh, you can just uh, come by to the office and ask for those tickets. Uh, for the new members class, we welcome them. And we welcome you if you would like to be a new member. November 8th and 15th are the dates to look for. So we hope that you can uh, join us. And also on the attendance pad, you can check the mark that says wish to join if you are interested. Men of Hope Breakfast, I had the joy of being with them the last time, and it's a great group. We invite you to be part of that. This is going to be next Thursday at 8 a.m. Uh, I don't think they are cooking, but bring your own food. No, I'm just kidding. They do have breakfast. Uh, so today we, we want to lift up special prayers for especially the family of uh, Eleanor Bell and for Roger. Uh, Eleanor had passed away November 1st. Uh, and we want to keep the family in prayer. Uh, there is uh, a request, especially for any volunteers who would like to assist with the uh, kitchen uh, work, and especially in uh, preparations for Thanksgiving, 11-14, on November 14th. Two of our volunteers, great volunteers, uh, we want to keep in prayers. Uh, they, they are out because one uh, had fell and one is going through surgery, so we want to pray for them. But if you would like to volunteer, for November 12th and 13th, please sign up, let us know, and contact uh, Debbie, Chef Debbie, at the church office if you would like to help. Now I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another.
the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
us pray together. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion, in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joys you have prepared for those who love you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The lesson of the day is from 2 Kings 5, 1 to 15a. The lesson begins. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go! Wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. The Gospel of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The good that I do, people never remember. 
the bad that I do, people never forget. That was a quote I could never forget. The good that I do, people never remember, but the bad that I do, people never forget. There is no doubt a human tendency to dwell on that which is not well. Kind of like a built-in GPS in the human mind that moves towards what is negative, what is missing, what is incomplete, or what's just not quite right. That just remember for a moment, the last time you lost something, could have been last night or even this morning. It doesn't matter what goes on around you at that moment. The only thing you can think of is that there is something missing. And you will not trust neither anyone around you, for that matter, until you find it. Or come to a full closure that you can't find it, will never find it, and grieve over it. That means going through the so-called five stages of loss and grief. Now, although they are and they have been reserved for a deeper kind of loss, I think they pretty much apply in a different way to losing just about anything. Listen to this. First is denial. I just can't believe that I lost my phone. I just can't believe it. This cannot be happening. Then it's anger. How can I do that? How could I be so sloppy? How can I misplace my phone? How could I not know where it is? It feels like a moment of anger. Then there is that bargaining stage. If I could have only bought that case for $5.99 the other day that I saw it. If I can find it, I will never lose it again. I'll hold on to it. I'll never let go of it. Then there is a moment of depression. Now we are still sad because we lost it, but we worry about the cost of a new phone and thinking what we could have bought with that same money instead of buying that same phone over again. Then finally, it's acceptance. We finally accept that we have lost it, there's nothing else we can do. We move on, get a new one, and enjoy that new phone. If anything, those stages can show us how much the mind can go through in the face of loss. There are no five stages of gaining, right? It's what when we gain, it's get it, got it, good. That's it. Imagine when our minds are consumed with what is missing. When our minds are consumed with what is negative, when our minds are consumed with what is lost, we cannot see the positive at the moment, no matter how positive it is. When you have lost something, it doesn't matter that it's sunny out there. It doesn't matter that there's a beautiful sunset in the evening. All you can think of is that I lost something. There's something missing in my life. Now, this feeling is not just limited to losing something, but also the feeling that something is missing. When we keep thinking something is missing in our lives, we go through similar emotions as if we have lost something. Not having enough money, not having any friends or many friends, not having or feeling physically fit, not having the perfect health. After all, we have been conditioned by the brain to always think negative. The brain itself is trained to identify with feelings of discomfort in the body and imposes pain. As a matter of fact, if you know and remember, pain is a sign of warning. It tells you that something is going on in the body. That's all pain is, although it is more painful than that. The feeling that I call a tendency to dwell on that which is not well. We like to dwell on what is not well. It truly drains our energy. It just, I believe, it sucks the joy out of our lives. But what is worse yet is when we apply this process, the tendency to dwell on what is not well, unto others. It's much easier to see the bad flaws that are in those who are around us. It's much easier to see the bad in someone else than that which is good. Now, this area specifically, I believe we have full control over. What we see in the other person is completely up to us and does not depend on what they do or who they are. Paul in Romans chapter 2 says this. You say, we know that God's judgment is on those who do such things in accordance with truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? 
Or do you despise the riches and kindness and the forbearance of our Lord? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Dwelling on the shortcomings of others may be an excuse for us to feel good about ourselves as if we don't have them. Or as if our shortcomings are not as bad as theirs. Our sins are not as great in comparison to what they do. We might laugh at those who cry as if for us it does not hurt. Or mock the ones who fail as if we have never failed before. Or giggle at someone who messes up as if we have never ever messed up. Or raise our eyebrows because someone lost their way as if we always knew where to go. Or call them cunning and deceitful, but as for us, it's just a white lie. Somehow, even in Jesus' time, people, they managed to find a negative in the Lord of the universe. I mean, they would say, isn't he from Nazareth? Isn't he the son of Mary, meaning that average poor girl? Isn't he the son of Joseph? I mean, Joseph was no brain surgeon. He was just a carpenter. So all this negativity can throw us between shame and guilt. And here I'd like to mention just real quick some of that difference based on a study by the Self-Image Depression and Trauma Institute. Shame means I, I am wrong. Guilt means I did something wrong. There is a big difference and an important one. Shame hurts our self-image and our belief that we can change things. We don't like about ourselves and our situation, but guilt is about feeling badly about a mistake. Shame does not lead to positive change. Guilt does. Guilt can inspire us to act differently in the future. Shame always leads to this connection from others. Guilt can lead to healing. Confessing our sins, confessing our errors and mistakes actually is very healthy because it makes, our, makes us open emotionally so that we can share with others. It builds a connection through communication or changed behavior. Shame is internalized and deeply connected to our sense of who we are. Guilt is often passing. Shame is never healthy or useful. Guilt can be healthy and useful. I mean, how we convey negative feedback matters. It can work better to simply state the harm caused than to shame the other person. Shame is about uh, continuing or causing that pain for an individual. Guilt is usually associated with accomplishments. Now, here's the thing. Shame underlies a host of psycho and social problems like depression, substance abuse, infidelity, and others, but guilt does not. With so much that is just imperfect and missing in our lives, and in the lives of others. We might think being a saint is just a dream. On this All Saints Sunday, who does not like to be called a saint? That's why I called you all sainty uh, earlier on. But the one thing I remember and I like about saints is that they were all sinners. Peter, for example, we call him a saint and even call him the rock. And by the way, his name is not rock from Greek because in that passage, Jesus says you are the you are Petros, not Petra. He said, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. Petros means pebble. Petra means rock. In other words, Jesus could have been saying, you are the pebble, and on this rock, I will build my church. You are just a pebble, but on this rock, Jesus Christ himself, I will build my church. He is the rock. He is our rock. Jesus is the rock. Everyone else is Peter, a pebble. How can someone who had publicly denied his Lord, like that pebble, Peter, was, who was doubtful, weak in faith at times, even uh, abandoning Jesus at the cross, be called a saint. Mary Magdalene, you say, we sing with the cherubim and the seraphim, with Mary Magdalene, and we say, holy, holy, holy. Mary Magdalene was anything but holy back in that day, and how she was perceived by the culture. We all know her history. Now, can someone who had not one or two or three, but seven demons be called holy? One of my favorites is the one I quote every day, St. Paul. St. Paul, how can someone who would have dedicated his life to the torturing of the Christians, going after newly converts, persecuting them, even killing them, breaking every commandment from thou shalt not kill to thou shalt not bear false witness, and yet be called a saint? 
St. Paul. And yet, Paul is the one that had written one-third of the New Testament. And what about calling some of the Corinthian saints? Maybe back in today we say walk like an Egyptian, but back in the day it was live like a Corinthian. Literally, it was live like a Corinthian because it meant to live and indulge in a life of immorality. But yet, Corinth was known for that lifestyle, and yet Paul would call them saints as the people who were there, who had come to Christ, of course. Even ancient saints, like the people that we don't say Saint David, we don't say perhaps Saint Moses, but maybe we should, because really, I mean, David, we consider as a saint, right? But yet he's the one who committed adultery and murder. And what about Moses, who had a kill and run situation, if you remember back in the day? And what about Jacob? Actually, the word Jacob, Jacob, means the one who deceives, the one who holds in the heel of the other. Actually, when he was born, Esau came first, and Jacob was holding in, uh, in the heel of his brother. That's why the word Jacob. But it also means deceiver, the one who was married not once, not twice, but four times, if you remember. He had four wives, Rachel, Leah, Bila, and Zilpha. But even from the ancient founding fathers, like one of my favorites, St. Augustine. I love St. Augustine of Hippo. He's considered to be the doctor of the church, one who had an 11-year-old fiancé, one who had engaged not just in uh, all what life can offer, but he had engaged in, in a relationship with his concubine that he would finally say, Lord, grant me chastity, but not yet, not now. And one that I love dearly, St. Francis of Assisi, Francesco. He was nicknamed Francesco by his father, the Frenchman. That's the title. But what is interesting about St. Francis that he is the one who had arranged the first Christmas manger back in 1224, as we come close to Christmas now and celebrate it. When he died, he wanted just to hear that Psalm 140 on his deathbed. St. Francis, Francis had an early life of wealth and extravagance, bright clothing, rich friends, and love of pleasures. He was disillusioned by the world and its materialism until his life was completely changed when he met one beggar. Saints and sinners, Luther would say, the paradox of good and evil remain in the person until death. Luther, Luther points out this. He says there's a difference between sinners and sinners. We're all sinners. But there's a difference between sinners and sinners, Luther writes. There are some sinners who confess that they have sinned, but do not long to be justified. Instead, they give up hope and go on sinning so that when they die, they despair, and while they live, they are enslaved to the world. There are other sinners who confess that they sin and that they have sinned, but they are sorry for this, hate themselves for it. They long to be justified and under groaning constantly pray God for righteousness. Now this, Luther says, are the people of God. These are the people of God. The saints who are saved in spite of their sin. Paul could see sinners as saints in and through Christ. As a matter of fact, the word Christian appears only three times in the New Testament. But the word saint appears over 60 times. Paul has referred to the people of Corinth and Ephesus and the Colossians all as saints. Paul could see how the blood of Christ sanctifies the sinners and redeems them and makes them holy. The word actually sanctified from Greek means to be set apart for God and to make something holy by offering a sacrifice. Peter, Mary Magdalene, Paul, Moses, David, Jacob, Augustine, Francis, you and I and everyone else who believes in Jesus are all sanctified. We are all set apart through God's love and grace. We have received the forgiveness of sins through his blood. For he says in Romans 5, for while we were still weak, while we were still sinners, Christ had died for us. Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God... God proves his love for us in the fact that while we were still sinners, while we are still sinners, Christ has died for us. Christ continues to die for us and to redeem our sins. Much more surely than now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him and through our Lord Jesus. Even in many ways, we know that today on this All Saints Sunday, 
we can truly feel the love of God. We can truly feel His forgiveness. We can truly feel that it's not because we are the ones who are perfect. Not because our lives don't have anything missing in them, but because God is the one who has reached out to us. The good that I do, people never remember. But the bad that I do, people never forget. But thank God that God and with God, it's a whole different story. For now in Christ and through Christ, we are cleansed from all unrighteousness. We are forgiven and our sins are forgotten. We are made whole through His blood. And now, when I confess my sins with all my heart, I know that the bad that I did, God never remembers. And the good that I will do, God will never forget. All saints were all sinners, but God could not remember the bad that they did and could not forget the good that His Son, Jesus Christ, has done on the cross of Calvary for their sake and for the sake of of the whole world. We have been cleansed by His blood. We have been forgiven. Today rejoice as the children of God. To our Lord Jesus be all the praise, riches, wealth, power, and honor now and forever. Amen. Living together in trust and hope as saints of God, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, friend of those in need, your son Jesus has untied our burdens and healed our spirits. We lift up the prayers of our hearts for those still burdened, those seeking healing, those in need within the church and the world. Today, the saints crowd around us, and we are grateful for friends who made us laugh so hard it hurt. Parents with lessons it took us so long to learn. Siblings holding our shared past. Mentors with their particular wisdom. We carry all of their legacy with us for the grace or the pain that came through them. We are grateful 
and also grief-filled, angry, resentful, and lost. Today, feeling the presence of the saints around us, those whom we now remember before you, O Lord. Mary Schmidt, Walter Morey, Dorothy Osdale, Lorraine Rudy, Al Tomanio, Jan Hennessy, Don Anderson, Eleanor Mollenhauer, Phil Stravino, Janet Bajan, Virginia Zimmerman, Marjorie Browett, Jean Beringer, Barbara Plant, Gary Mohan, Donald Bretz, Joe Hatcher, Gordy Metcalf, Irv Vigut, Joe Schnoor, Hubert Hub Hansen, Bill Anderson, Ronald Resch, Edward Brown, Mo Jorgensen, Kent Evensat, Judy Wallace, Janice Weingartner, Dottie Kopenhofer, Richard Davis, Andrew Zimmerman, Ray Schnabel, Ruth Smith, June Lee, Bob Cherry, Alfred Goodenconnect, Keith Griner, Arlene Griseth, Robert Bob Spears, Patricia Cruz, Joan Artman, Marion Zielinski, Robert Siebold, Kristen Bonilla,
Elizabeth Sears. Joyce Brooks. Manuel Manny Knudsen. Irma Benner. Ken Swanson. Jack Shadell. Jackie Merriman. Florence Edgar. Lila Radar. Jean Tilly. Robert Bob Walters. Fran Seidel. Judy Boots. Kenneth Christie. Sarah Chris Curry. Harold Hansen. Donna Hartfield. Richard Miller. David Martin. Today, feeling the presence of the saints around us, may we receive the blessing we need and return our thanksgiving to you, Lord, in your mercy. God, we thank you for those unnamed people among us who speak up for the sick, the marginalized, whom you generously lavish with your grace. We give thanks for your power of healing and mercy which you shower on us every day. Strengthen our faith, faith so that we may see in your fingerprint everywhere. And when we hear your voice, help us to follow. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Father God, you know the desires of our hearts and you know the prayers in our hearts, but not yet on our lips. Be with those who have asked us to pray for them, for those who cannot remember any longer and the people who care for them those struggling with a new diagnosis and the family that surrounds them, for all those difficult things in our lives that you whispered peace, that you whispered peace can soothe, we now ask in our hearts or aloud on our lips. Touch all with your grace and peace, Lord, in your mercy. O God of compassion, through the witnesses of a captive maidservant, you healed Naaman in the waters of the Jordan. Through Jesus, you healed the lepers. Heal us so that we may follow Christ with joy, giving thanks with all our being through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, who after his resurrection sent forth the apostles to preach the gospel and to teach all nations and promised to be with them even to the end of the age. And so with the glorious company of the apostles and with the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy and greatest of the majesty and your glory. So you so love the world that you gave your only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to, to fulfill your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. Our Lord Jesus Christ on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant. The promise sealed my blood by my blood, which is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Jesus' life and ministry, his call for us to follow, his death and resurrection, we lift this bread and cup before you, O God, giving thanks that you have made us your servant people, and we ask that you send your spirit upon these gifts of your church to gather us into one, all who share this sacrament. Fill us with your spirit that we may praise and glorify you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join hands now as a community and we will sing the prayer our Lord has taught us. Broken and divided, we are united by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ as his saints now and forever. 
Amen. Please be seated. Come to all is now ready.
the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious Lord, for this gift of life that you have given to us. We pray that you will strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward others for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen.